it's time. So we are just about ready to start our session. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We have people on the Zoom call this morning with us from truly all over. I see colleagues from Turkey. I see colleagues from Peru, a colleague from Spain. It's wonderful to have you all, as well as colleagues from here in the United States. I hope that everyone is able to be safe uh, and that you and your families are healthy and as protected as, as one can be in these extraordinary times. Uh, here we are, Nina Reeves and Scott Yaris for a new, uh, uh, the next in our round of office hours. These are uh, informal opportunities for us to chat with you folks a bit about Stuttering therapy, because what we do at Stuttering Therapy Resources all day long, every day, is talk about stuttering, think about stuttering, and we want to share some ideas about stuttering. So my name is Scott Yaris. I'm a professor at Michigan State University and also uh, on the side for fun. I do this Stuttering Therapy Resources with my colleague, friend, and co-author, Nina Reeves. Uh, you'll be able to see Nina on the screen. Do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself? So I'm Nina Reeves, and I'm a fluency specialist from Dallas, Texas, and I'm in the public schools and private practice. And then, of course, I work with Scott, and we produce many materials and information for our colleagues who work with children who stutter. Excellent. Thanks, Nina. This is the fourth in our series of Office Hours Fridays that we've been holding to try to help everybody, our colleagues in speech language pathology, people who are interested in stuttering, try to help people through uh, this time sharing ideas that we have uh, about therapy. One thing that I'm going to do just now, though, is we're going to be pausing our recording because I'm about to share something with you. Today, we're going to tackle some tough stuff. The questions that Nina and I get when we do our lectures and we do our talks and people ask these questions and they come up a lot, the tough things like what do we do with people who speak more than one language and how do we help when there's a co-occurring disorder? We're going to talk about those issues today. Now, our session today is going to be a high-level overview, right? We can't necessarily address everything that we'd like to say. Here's the list of the discussion topics, but before we dive into these, I'm going to make Nina crazy. Let's do that front matter that I was supposed to be doing, and then we'll come into this. She's got the slides, and I've got the, the voice. So next slide. Okay. Oh, that is the next slide. Okay. Well, we hope to have time for question and answer, but where's the housekeeping stuff? Sorry. Um, it's coming next. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Housekeeping. Office hours will more or less be recorded. Um, and I see people are already entering chats. That is terrific. You can type questions into the chat window. We will get to as many as we can. If we don't get to them all, don't worry. We'll be doing these as a series. We'll plan another uh, office hours for them, or we may be able to reply to you with some of the resources that are already on our website. The video for this will be posted on our YouTube channel, Stuttering Therapy Res. And now, yes, please don't record this on your own uh, for privacy reasons. Uh, we will post it. Uh, so you will be welcome to watch that replay. All right, what's next? That's it for now. Us. Okay. Us. <laughs> so I I'm going to be uh, starting off with our first topic today. Nina did briefly flash up the topics. We'll be coming back to that. Um, but the first topic is particularly relevant when everybody is online right now. And that is, how do we help kids who are experiencing cyberbullying? We know already that cyberbullying is a problem and has been a problem for children who stutter. In fact, bullying in general is a problem for children who stutter. One of the things that we know from research, such as that done by Gordon Blood at Penn State University and others, is that children who stutter are more likely to experience bullying than other children. And that's a problem because bullying makes people feel bad, and kids who stutter are already at risk for feeling bad about themselves. Bullying isolates people socially and 
are kids who start, are already at risk of social isolation. So bullying in and of itself is something that we as speech language pathologists need to be able to address and we need to address it proactively. For that reason, I just want to mention to you, we have developed materials specifically to help children who stutter, who experience bullying. This is based on the work of Bill Murphy, uh, a long time uh, clinical supervisor at uh, Purdue University. Bill, Bob Quiesel worked with us on this program called Minimizing Bullying for Children Who Stutter. And it is a comprehensive treatment approach that includes not just a guide for SLPs, but also guides for parents, for the students themselves, and for teachers and administrators. Part of what I'm going to talk about right now comes from this material that you can find on your website, uh, on our website, not your website, our website. Uh, so I want you to be aware, first of all, that bullying requires a comprehensive approach. We can't only work on it with the child. We need to be working with those in the child's environment to increase their understanding of stuttering and to help them understand for school age children, one of the most important things to know is that it is okay to stutter. That's where everything starts. And from there, we build on helping to desensitize the child to his fears about stuttering, helping to educate the others in the school about stuttering, educate the teachers and help the parents build the child's self-esteem. So these are all critical aspects of helping children with bullying, and they're outlined in that program in great detail. But cyberbullying then is different, okay? Cyberbullying is any example that you can think of, of, <clears throat> pardon me, sorry, any example you can think of, of a child experiencing negative reactions online. Either the negative reactions that they get when they're communicating with others in their class, or the posts that go on Facebook, or the posts that go on Twitter, or the things that get shared that were private information that we didn't want to be shared. And whereas in-person bullying is terribly uncomfortable with the people who are around you at the time, one of the differences with cyberbullying is that it can be instantly shared widely, even to people that you don't know, people that you're never going to see, but you can be aware that now everybody is hearing this thing around you. What do we do about it? Some of it is just basic common sense management of the child's online experiences. Right now, we're facing a situation where our kids are thrust into being on the computer much more than they were before. They're being thrust into needing to talk in front of their class on the computer, and they know that everybody in the class is looking at them. And as exposed as they felt when they were sitting in the classroom experiencing this, now there's their image right up there for everybody to see on the Zoom, and they know that everybody is thinking only about their speech, or at least that's how it feels to them. So we have to help them understand that A, Bullying is never acceptable. That's where we start. That's the assumption that we start with. Nobody deserves to experience bullying. We reject the idea that just because it happened to one kid, it should happen to another kid, or just because that's how kids are. We have to absolutely reject that. Two, we may have to work more closely with teachers, even though I know that's very difficult to do as everybody's scrambling to this online world, but we have to help them become aware of the fact that this is putting a spotlight on the child in a way that he might not be ready for. We have to continue with our efforts to educate the other children in the class that when they see the child stuttering, that's okay. That's just part of how he talks. But think of the difference for the child. Maybe he's sitting in his class of 20 or 30 kids and he stutters when he's reading out loud, but they're not necessarily looking at him. Now, online, they're looking right at his face, and maybe his face is full screen, and he sees his face in that corner window, and he becomes very sensitive about how he looks when he stutters. We need to educate teachers that some options need to be explored, maybe, where the child wouldn't have to share his video for a period of time until you're able to help him desensitize that. And we need to help the parents understand, you know, just six short weeks ago, all of the SLPs were thinking about the damages that screen time does to our kids. And now here everybody screen time all the time. The parents do need to be aware of what this opens children up to. And they need to be particularly vigilant in this time of monitoring the children's online use, 
not only, <clears throat> pardon me, sorry, not only because of um, what it exposes them to, but also because of the risk of increased bullying experiences. There's tons more to say on that topic. It's one of my favorite topics, but we have a whole bunch of favorite topics today. So I'm going to leave it there for now, but see, Nina, do you have anything that you would like to add, please? No, I think you covered it really well as an overview and um, everything that we've written and talked about. And I do, oh, I guess I do have something I want to say. Don't forget, Scott, you have an entire series of videos. I don't know if you mentioned them. But I didn't, and I should have, yes. <laughs> they're on the website um, and they're under resources and there's an entire lovely series of videos about helping um, students and others around the student uh, learn how to handle bullying um, and teasing in their environment. So uh, thank you for that. Nina. Resources are there. You bet. I just shared the screen so people can see where the resources page is. You will see here where the video from today will be posted. There's a spot there for it. But if you slide down a bit, you're going to find practical tips and videos about minimizing bullying for children who stutter. So these are all free, of course. Please download them, share them, uh, let people know about them, because um, the more we can help all of our colleagues, uh, come together and learn some information about this, uh, the more of our students and families that we help. Exactly. Okay. So my, uh, my task first is to talk about um, students who have attention deficit disorder, as well as some fluency disorders. So um, this is a fun topic for me. I, I enjoy talking about it. Um, I have a lot of students uh, right now, just happen to have a whole co cohort of students who present with both. They have ADHD or ADD and stuttering. And so um, one of the things I will say to just begin with, I'll start with a mistake that I made that I'd love to share with you so that it's not something maybe you go down the path of. I started to uh, work with kids with ADHD, you know, well before I was specializing with uh, students who stutter. And um, I was trying to navigate ADHD without learning enough about it. And I think what happens when I went into the specialty with stuttering is that I was focused on the stuttering and was trying to ignore the ADHD in some way and that I just needed to, you know, get this child to work with me on their stuttering. And I had to go back and say, wait, this is a this is a population that presents with challenges we need to be aware of aside from their stuttering and um, very much get into the planning of helping the people around this child understand both of the disorders this child is presenting with and how they're going to impact our stuttering therapy so making uh, time to work with parents talking about executive functioning because uh, these children present with executive functioning uh, problems such as, well, you know, they like immediate gratification. It's hard for them to wait. Um, it, they have some impulse control issues. There are students that have difficulty attending to tasks, planning and organizing and following through on their tasks. They may be able to start it, but they can't finish it. You know, their, their brains seem to move on more quickly. Um, so per persistence for them is difficult. And these types of executive functioning issues really shine a light on what we're gonna need to do to adjust our therapy. And I mean, any therapy that you're doing with a child who also has ADHD, um, language therapy, uh, articulation therapy. So the things that I'm gonna go through now are just general guidelines that I've used um, that have helped me be more successful with my kids who have co-occurring. Um, I'm going to have you look behind me. Do you see the distractible space? Miss Nina, look how Scott's is, and then look at mine. And we, we laugh about this all the time, especially since we've been doing these Zooms, that there is just, there's a different style going on here. And neither one is good or bad, but I will let you know, number one, when I have students with ADHD in this room, they are seated at a, at a chair that looks at my wall over here, which has very little on it. And so I actually position my students and I've had to clean my wall to accommodate the fact that these kiddos have a hard time 
focusing and too much distraction is not great. So um, I, I know that I have to put these students into smaller groups. Because of, that, um, because of that difficulty waiting my turn, if they're in a group of five students in a, in a, in a district um, a therapy room, it's, they're gonna have too much time on their hands waiting for their turn of whatever you're doing. So smaller groups, making sure the, the lessons are at a pace that this child can handle. I've had to learn about each individual child before launching into therapy because every kid with ADHD is not the same and their learning styles and what they can handle are different. So as I learn what they need, I, I'll pull distractions out of the environment as I already talked about. Um, I'll switch tasks more often even keeping, you know, keeping the same concept, but using different tasks and finding what works best for that kiddo. We have to help, and then we have to help parents understand this and teachers. These students, because of what's going on and how they manage life, are going to need more repetition of the skills that we are teaching them, and they're going to be needing more review. So when I begin an IEP meeting with a parent of a child who stutters who also has ADHD, we talk right away about the fact that I'm gonna outline some of the goals and objectives that we're trying to meet for this annual um, year. But I want you to know some of these goals and objectives, even if they're mastered during the year, they're gonna pop back up next year. Some of them may need to be reviewed. It's not that the child can't learn it, it's that sometimes they, the, the working memory and they can't remember it as much or as often, which also brings me to one of my final points um, with kids in this population is that the idea that they're going to be able to self-monitor and to utilize strategies on their own, um, that's gonna take more time with these kids. Okay, so we're going to have to adjust how we help them learn to self monitor and we're going to have to adjust our expectations for some of them about their ability to think about their strategy before they talk or handle a, a stutter mid stutter when they're not even able to sense that they're stuttering until after it's happened. And so we we do what we already know and you're going to hear me say that, and you'll hear Scott say that today a lot, we're gonna take evidence-based practice of our fluency disorders, and we're not gonna completely change, hi, Kitty, welcome to Zoom. Um, we're not gonna completely change our entire therapy around this uh, co coexisting disorder, but we are gonna need to adapt. And so we will make our, <laughs> we will make our time in dedicating, um, in dedicating that specific to stuttering issue of, of self-monitoring and being able to remember to use strategies. And we have to help the people around them understand that as well. This isn't going to go as fast and it might not be a straight shot, but these children are capable of learning how to manage and handle stuttering in the long term. So just as your cat's coming to join us on the Zoom, I just heard outside the room, I don't know if the mic picked it up. Oh no, dog out. The mail, the post office came to ship our, our daily shipment of books out. And uh, one of the dogs is going for a run in the neighborhood right now. So <laughs> <clears throat> it's a new life, it's a new life. Excellent, thank you for that superb answer, Nina. Indeed, I get this question all the time and these children are more difficult to work with and we have to be patient. One tiny little thing I want to add, because I loved every word of that, is we might have to help the parents be more patient, too, because they often are, are very eager to be moving forward with the, with the process. And, and they know that the kids are different. They just have to understand that that also applies to how they're going to move through stuttering therapy. Yes. And Scott, we should peg back on, I was just realizing I forgot to talk about um, the effects of medication. And we're oh. not going to go. We're not going to go deep into this. This is an overview, and there's much to say. But I'm just going to bring you uh, the clinical experiences that I've had in in the idea that 
I get this question, and Scott and I talk about this a lot. The question is always, you know, um, does does ADHD medication impact stuttering? And how does it impact stuttering? And I've had this kid who didn't stutter before he went on meds, and then he started to stutter. And then we hear from other colleagues who are like, I had this child who um, was stuttering, and then he went on medications, and he didn't stutter as much anymore. So I'm going to give uh, just a, a quick idea that just like everything else, programs, devices, and drugs, these things affect everyone differently. So there's no specific answer to any drug of how it's going to affect a child's stuttering or whether it will at all. And so we just need to be cognizant that if a child is also on medications, we've got to learn about that med medication. We've got to be in collaboration with other professionals um, because sometimes it's not even the medication that's affecting. It might be the dosage. It might be whether the child is on the right medication. We don't make those decisions, but we are part of the team that has input into how that child's medication may be impacting their entire uh, environment, not just their stuttering, their ability to listen in class and all of the other things that go on uh, for a kid with ADHD. So just the medication part is, is a variant, but uh, we want that, parents want that answer and they want a specific and we're not able to give that to them because it affects everyone differently. I just, I love one thing you said. I love all the things you said, but one thing in particular that I really want to emphasize, you're as, as an SLP, as a professional, you are part of the team. Don't defer to everything to, oh yes, the doctor takes care of that. Of course, we don't do the medical part, but we do and how we do have a, a right to be and deserve to be and a responsibility to be involved from the communication part. What's next? <laughs> next, I believe uh, you're going to do um, multilingual. Oh, very good, very good, excellent. All right, this is a huge and hugely important issue. What do we do when there's a child who speaks more than one language? We get the question all the time about what do we do if he stutters more in one language than the other language or doesn't stutter at all in one language and stutters all entirely in that other. <clears throat> Here's one thing to know, first of all, is that this dips of stuttering in one language or stuttering in the other language can occur in any pattern that you can think of. Perhaps more in language one and less in language two, perhaps more in language two and less in language one. And that could be the same, of course. And it can also change and fluctuate over time. This is just part of the variability and the individuality of stuttering. So try not to, I know it's very hard to do because I fall into this as well, but try not to read too much into, well, he doesn't stutter at all in that language because that's not really telling you a whole lot. There's a host of reasons that that might be the case, including just that's the way it is. We can try to make sense of it, but we're going to have trouble doing that because it's individualized with stuttering. But here's the more important point about this then, and that is that we know that when we're doing a diagnosis with young children, trying to determine if that young child stutters, Courtney Bird and other researchers have demonstrated that you are more likely to see so-called stutter-like disfluencies, maybe part word repetitions, in children who are multilingual, who are learning more than one language. And that does not mean that they're stuttering, okay? That does mean that children who are multilingual have different disfluency types, and that's all it means. So we have to be careful not to, on the one hand, over-diagnose children who are not stuttering and stuttering simply because they're bilingual, but then we have to be careful not to then underdiagnose them to ju by just saying, oh yeah, bilingual kids, they do part word repetitions and don't worry about it. What we've got to do is look beyond the surface behavior that the child is exhibiting because it doesn't tell us as much as we thought it did. Once upon a time, we thought that we could just look at the behaviors a child is doing and if there are part word repetitions, we call them stuttering. 
okay? Now we know that's not the case, especially in children who are multilingual, but even in children who aren't multilingual, you can still see a range of behaviors, and we don't want to read too much into that. But then in terms of providing the therapy, <clears throat> it is, of course, best to provide therapy in the language that the child is best going to be able to understand you. That's key. Okay, so if you're able, and I know from the people that I know on our call right now, I know that some of you are bilingual speech language pathologists. Thank you for being that because you then open up options for children who might not otherwise get the therapy delivered in the language that they have the greatest ease in. But beyond the children, it's the parents. We have to make sure that the parents are also getting access to the information. So maybe the child is able to speak uh, enough English to, to cope well in therapy and to cope well in school, but his family language, his primary language, maybe all that's spoken at home, the parents may not have access in the same way. So working hard to make sure that materials are available in multiple languages is something that our field really needs to focus on. In particular, our name. I can tell you that we at Stuttering Therapy Resources have been working to make our materials available in Spanish and in other languages. We have a lot of our practical tips on the website already available in Spanish. We have some in Arabic. We have one in Romanian. And this week, we just added our first one in Vietnamese. So, uh, And the people who do these for us are, are just, just helping. In fact, uh, Denise Behrens is on the line right now. I've just got to thank you, Denise, for all the great work you've done in making our materials available. And others are doing this, too. The Stuttering Foundation has an entire website in Spanish, tartamudes.org. So you can send your families there. The worksheets that are in our books are in Spanish. And the Oasis in Spanish is almost done. Uh, it's just getting a final proofread right now. So for working with children who are multilingual or who come from other language backgrounds, number one, don't over-diagnose. Number two, don't under-diagnose. Number three, be very aware of making materials available to them and in particular to their parents. And number four, I saved the most important one for last on my little bit here, and that is very often parents will ask the question, should I not teach my child a second language? Will that make him stutter? Do bilingual kids stutter more than other kids? And the answer is no. You can find literature out there uh, on the internet. If you search the internet, you can find where people have said, don't teach a second language. It puts too much stress on the child. And there is absolutely zero evidence to support that statement. The families teach their children a second language, a third language for a reason. And we know that people learn languages best when they are young. I would hate for a child to, learn, to, to miss out on learning a second language that's relevant to his history and culture, that's important for his family, simply because of a fear about there might be stuttering. Absolutely not. Because if there is stuttering, we'll deal with that. That's a separate issue. Let's give the child the best opportunity to learn his language of origin or his family language uh, and do it when they're still young. There is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that we should not teach children second language, third language, just because they stutter. Nina, please add. Yeah. I, I just, I think you hit all of the high points. You know, I always love what you say. And I don't have a lot to add, except that um, whenever you say things like, you know, I would hate to have them miss out, being an, a veteran human being trying to learn another language at my age, I will tell you, I will, I, I hope that people continually make those decisions based on what's best for their family and for the culture that they're in. And we can deal with multilingual and stuttering um, just fine in therapy and we can, we can help. And so um, I really love when you, when you make those points. Uh, Scott and I, again, we, we talk about this a lot because it's, I would say what the number one, number two question we get when we go to present and train with other colleagues on uh, various areas of fluency disorders. But this is one of the scenarios that has become a, a bigger topic as we start to see more and more students presenting with not stuttering, 
and not cluttering, but a fluency to is order that sort of breaks in the middle, 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 or goes on final syllable, or just prolongation. And these children are referred to us because that's a break in fluency. But in the past decade, I think we all know they've been misdiagnosed. Because we all weren't sure what this was, we went into what we knew, which was stuttering or fluttering. And so these kiddos got di uh, diagnosed, misdiagnosed for the past few years. We're very excited to know that people continually ask this question because they're aware that this isn't stuttering or cluttering. And so we're excited that the, the question comes from a base of knowledge that something different is here. So we're making a differential diagnosis. In these students, we have been finding, both in research and in clinical anecdotal evidence, that more than just a few of these kiddos are on the autism spectrum. In fact, that's where it really began. It was students with autism and stutter, uh, uh, autism and this disfluency that were showing up in, in, our, in our therapy rooms and in our uh, diagnostic rooms. Um, through the years though, we have been finding that these students um, are, are doing atypical disfluencies are also presenting with ADHD high degrees of ADHD or ADD. And so that population can have atypicals. And then to make it all just more exciting, children who are neurotypical, who have no coexisting diagnoses may also present. On a, certainly in a lesser percentage, we're not seeing as many of those kiddos. But as Scott often says, when we talk about this, those kids aren't reading the manual. They're, they're just, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> They're not supposed to do this. And, but after we get that frustration out, we have to say, okay, what are we going to do about this? Because these kids are being referred. And so the good news is, is that I finally put, you know, put my fingers on the typewriter or on the computer. Oh God, that makes me so old. I just said typewriter. Um, <laughs> on the keyboard. And um, we now have a blog and I, I can see Scott moving. He's going to show you. Um, we just this week put up a blog of everything that I'm going to say to you, plus a lot of resources that you can go to get more information on this population. I'm going to take a step back, you know, as I say, differential diagnosis. The number two thing after that is to know, is this impacting the child's ability to communicate and how much? Is this a battle we need to fight right now? Um, so many times, and I actually had a parent say it to me once, I know you can't cure my child of autism, so if you could just get rid of this, that would be great. It was like, it, it was so real. She, she, she knew you know, what we couldn't control, but she was looking for something that maybe we could. And so I think we have to make sure that people around the child are also gaining the perspective of how much is this important for this child right now. So a couple of things, because I don't want to go too far into this. These children don't often know that they're doing it, okay? They're like cluttering, they have a, a, a difficult time knowing why people are talking to them about their speech. Some kids do know they're doing it, but many, many do not. And so um, it may not matter to them. So there's a, a buy-in for therapy that may or may not work. And so we have to talk with kiddos about what's going on with their speech. We want to find out how much they know. Um, these children can also present, I don't want to forget to say, they can also present with stuttering and or cluttering. So it could be a mixture. Um, I'm just going to stay on the atypicals for, the, for this time today. When we get into therapy, knowing that they have a hard time even knowing that they're doing this or caring, um, we, I have three tips that have been successful in my therapy sometimes, okay? Not with everyone, but sometimes. Helping them learn to self-monitor. 
Did you, you know, have it not trying to catch them like gotcha, there was one right there, but more like, what did you think about that? Did you sense any, any times where you put in an extra uh, out, maybe in the middle, okay? What, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Because many of these students do not experience tension. They're not feeling a moment of tension. So helping them learn to self-monitor. I've had some success with pausing and phrasing, which is something we bring from evidence-based practice in fluency disorders. Helping the child learn to connect their phrases um, and have appropriate breaks. What's, the, what's an appropriate break in your speech? That's you know flow and pause, and flow and pause. And finally, and I know uh, Viv Siskin, Vivian Siskin writes a lot about this, and you're going to see Kathy Scaler Scott's and Vivian Siskin's names down in the blog. Um, they've done the most writing about this that I know about. Um, I want, uh, they, uh, Vivian talks about cancellation. With some of these students, she's had some success, and I've tried it out, and it's been fairly successful as well. If the child can self monitor and know that it's happened afterwards, then they go back and they connect the word without the extra break or the extra syllable ul, ul, at the end. And so it's not to be perfect and it's not about fluency or anything like that. It's about helping them increase their flow and decrease the atypical disfluency patterns that they're experiencing. So I hope that, um, oh, and all surrounding parent education. I know I said that at the top of what I just started to talk about, and I'm gonna really say it at the bottom. Helping parents understand that this, um, if the child does not have any other fluency disorders, that this is interrelated sometimes with a coexisting issue, and therefore our therapy is going to be um, different, and we're going to have to be more patient with helping these kiddos because, Success is sporadic, and parents need to know that, that it's not just going to get cleaned up quick and we're moving on to the next thing. Scott, anything to add? Yes, there's one It's directly, whoops, no, am I, I'm not muted, right? Right. Okay, great. We have a question here that's directly related. It says, um, what diagnosis do you give? when it's atypical stuttering, what about when it is the child who doesn't have that clear concomitant LD, ADHD, ASD disorder? They just, uh, not cluttering, they just doing, ooing, ooing, this kind of thing. Yeah. I will tell you, I say atypical disfluencies, okay? And yeah, I just say your child has a fluency disorder. Uh, we, we're diagnosing him as a fluency disorder under that category, but these are atypical. I don't call it atypical stuttering. If you want to confuse a parent, call it atypical cluttering or atypical stuttering, because then it, we get into the whole, you know, mesh. So atypical disfluencies, and um, I'm going to say this out loud, as Scott and I have talked about this, I think it's a third fluency disorder. I go out on a limb because I'm not a researcher and people can get mad at me if they want, but clinically, anecdotally, if this isn't a third fluency disorder, I'll eat my hat. Like there is something else going on here that is not stuttering because they don't feel the out of control moment of tension and not cluttering because they don't present with the differential diagnosis of that. And I think, I think we're, if the research moves forward, which it is, and, and if the clinic, clinicians get involved in the research, I think we might be looking at that. Yeah, and I'm gonna second that. It's interesting challenge that we've got right now in our field because for so long in our field, people didn't wanna use the S word stutter because of old beliefs about you know, that causing problems for people. So then the field, we make a little progress on that, helping people know that we can say the child is stuttering. And for many people who stutter, that word fluency is very uncomfortable for them because they've spent their lives, you know, everybody focusing on their fluency and harping on you gotta be fluent. And, and so now we're saying, oh, stutter, okay, fine. But now we have to say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's not just stuttering right? There's fluency conditions. If you don't want to use the D word disorder, there's fluency conditions. 
Stuttering is one example. Cluttering is one example. And as Nina said, this, this atypical, this unexpected pattern that we used to say, nah, people don't stutter that way. And they may not be stuttering, but they're disfluent that way for sure. So indeed, we may need to re revise our, our thinking about these categories just a bit. It's going to be very hard to do because we're going to need a lot of research. And kids who aren't experiencing a problem because of their low self-monitoring skills aren't really out there looking for therapy or looking to participate in research at this point. So we have work to do there. And in fact, there's a question on this. And before we move on to the next one, I think, uh, uh, in answer to the question, if the student doesn't, if the student can communicate, gets his or her ideas across, has no, you know, uh, no um, negative affect, um, does the atypical disfluency need to be treated? I'm going to answer that like I answer anything else. Does this need to be treated? That need to be treated? If the child is communicating and this doesn't impact, um, then we have to make a decision as a team is this something we need to address, especially in those children who have coexisting issues where we have lots of other things we could be working on? Is this where we want to spend our time right now? So I think it's about differential diagnosis and deciding as a team what is the priority. Okay. Uh, that, that question and ones like it came up about yeah. what do we do and if there's no adverse impact, even if it's typical stuttering. Yeah. Now, this is, I want to emphasize one thing. This is maybe for school-age children and above. For preschoolers, while we still have a hope eliminating the stuttering as an issue for them entirely, then for preschoolers, yeah, we do a lot of things with preschoolers that they don't want to do. But for school-age and up, once it's clear that the stuttering is going to stay or the atypical fluency is going to stay, then we, it sounds crazy, but then we have all the time in the world. There's no longer a, a critical period that we're fighting. We want to help them when they're ready for that help. Great, right. really important topic. Next one is, is for me, it's Tourette's and stuttering. We get this question very often. Um, what if it's not really stuttering? What if it's Tourette's? Or the child stutters and also has Tourette's. Or he just started stuttering and he's older than the typical age of onset of between two and a half and, and four years. He just started stuttering at age eight or at age 12. Could it be Tourette's? Indeed, there is some research suggesting commonalities between stuttering and Tourette's, but they are not the same and they don't co-occur that much. They do some. If you draw a Venn diagram, kids who stutter, if you're looking at preschoolers, maybe you're talking about 5% if you're looking at school age kids, which is when Tourette's is, you know, as they get a little older, you're likely to see that, you know, that's a low percentage. And yes, those Venn diagrams are going to cross at some point. It happens. There are some uh, studies suggesting that maybe it happens a little bit more than we'd expect, but it is not the majority by, by any means. But it can be difficult sometimes to do a differential diagnosis if the child has later, maybe sudden, not necessarily, but later onset of stuttering, if the behavior that they're exhibiting is Tourette's, a tick, or if it's stuttering. And that can especially be true if it's those less typical disfluency types that they're exhibiting, where air you'll find that ache in the middle of the word or a quick, sharp breath in. So one thing to start off with is the differential diagnosis. The differential diagnosis between Tourette's and stuttering. Stuttering behaviors only occur during speech. Tourette's behaviors can occur at other times, okay? They're often called tics. Uh, often you'll hear doctors and physician, uh, physicians and, and psychiatrists uh, talk about stuttering behavior as tics, but they are not. It's just the word that that profession is familiar with. For us, we call them disfluencies or moments of stuttering, okay, or, or stutters. Some people just make it a noun, okay? It's a stutter. That's fine. Um, but that's not a tic. So the first thing is we have to differentiate. And when people ask me about stuttering in Tourette's, the first thing I ask is, does he exhibit any of the behaviors during a time when he is not stuttering? If he is, sorry, when he's not speaking, when he's not speaking. If he, I gotta start that over because it's the most important sentence I'm gonna say here. I wanna make sure I say it right. Um, does he exhibit the behaviors at times when he's not speaking? If he is, then it's not stuttering, right? I'm not gonna say it's necessarily Tourette's, it could be something else too, but it's not stuttering, okay? 
if the behaviors happen during speech and at other times, then we look to a possible diagnosis of Tourette's. Now, Tourette's is like stuttering in some ways. It's genetically influenced, and it's a complicated inheritance, and it's more boys than girls, and it has this sort of odd onset that happens later, sometimes after typical behavior, uh, typical development. So yes, maybe there are some, some similarities in that way, but otherwise, we don't overlap them. There are some excellent resources out there uh, to help people understand stuttering and Tourette's. In particular, I'm bringing up the website of the Stuttering Foundation, and you will find a brochure on stuttering and Tourette's syndrome. This was written by Luke Danil uh, and Paul Sandor. In addition, um, Joe Donaher has done work on this and written about this, but this would be where I would go, and this is where I refer families when they ask this question. But the first thing is to say, yes, let's try to get a differential, recognizing that they might overlap, but we're going to treat them in different ways. We're going to treat stuttering like stuttering. The treatment of Tourette's is actually outside our scope of practice. Thoughts? And now I'm going to round us out with the idea of um, stuttering and Down syndrome. And so I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I make the scope a little bigger. Uh, so any child with an intellectual challenge, uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about here will be appropriate for them. And so um, let, let's start out with making the, the disclaimer that Children with Down syndrome or children with intellectual disabilities are all different from each other. So we want to make sure that we don't pigeonhole or stereotype what, what we're going to see when we have a child come into our, into our school or into our office. Um, these children present with um, challenges intellectually, but that's all dependent upon their uh, adaptation and what, what's happening for them. Thank you, Scott. Um, and the first thing to know about these kiddos is that they can present with one or multiple fluency disorders, okay? So they can come in and have some stuttering and a little bit of cluttering, or atypical disfluencies and some stuttering, or present with excessive non-stutter disfluencies that break their speech up a lot and people call it stuttering. So again, the word differential diagnosis is very important to figure out where these kiddos are and what we're going to be looking at. Now, they can be aware or unaware. There's, there's been a lot of talk, I've heard, a, I've heard a lot of clinicians say, oh, they don't know that they stutter or they're not aware of it. And I got to tell you, that couldn't be further from the truth for many of these students. It's not that they're not aware. Some may not be, but some may be. And they just may not be able to language to us their frustration or their um, awareness that they're having trouble talking. So don't, uh, we don't want to automatically assume that they wouldn't have any negative affect because they're not aware because that, um, that doesn't happen for all of those kiddos, all right? And so, um, like the children that I talked about with ADHD, these children present with some exec executive function delays, all right? And so, actually, my best time I've spent as a practicing clinician has not been pigeonholing myself into learning about Down syndrome, um, all the time, or ADHD, or Tourette's, I learn about executive functioning, and I get better at everything. And so uh, reading and learning and understanding the research on executive functioning in all children helps me be a better clinician, especially for these kids with coexisting issues. And so a couple Nina, of can things. Can I just throw something in really quickly there? Yes. There's more and more research on EF in children who stutter as well, including some papers that have just come out. Ooh. So if any of you are interested in the EF stuttering overlap, just drop me a note. I can send some of these new, brand new papers out to you. Or he could do a blog on it. And we could also add it to the list. <laughs> I know. Time, time, time. Okay, and so let's just talk uh, through a couple of the ideas about therapy, because we just talked about differential diagnosis. Let's talk about the therapy. Um, 
you know, they're going to need more time, they're going to need more repetition. The reinforcements for this population are going to need to be adapted. I have found with the students I've been working with, um, definitely everything needs to be more concrete. I don't, I don't throw out my stuttering understanding and my evidence-based practice. I bring it in and then I layer what can be more concrete. Because sometimes what I talk about with neurotypical kids um, is too high level as far as um, intelligence quotient. And so I just bring it to a more concrete way. Uh, for these kiddos and see what we can do. And then if that doesn't work, I try something else because these kiddos can acclimate to the things that we do in therapy. They're just gonna need some adaptations. One of the things with the children with Down syndrome that I've worked with that was hard for me was cueing. The possibility of needing a cue, so teaching them some strategies to ease up their communication so that they could communicate when they wanted to, um, but they can't always just do it on the fly. And so the idea of, you know, maybe a physical cue or a, um, a cue from a parent or a trusted adult, because it's very important not to overdo this and, and make certain that these kiddos are not being cued constantly. But balancing their ability to self-monitor and have self-awareness with the ability that they may have to, um, to move through a stutter in an easier way. Um, we're going to adjust the language load uh, of all of our activities and, um, and how we explore beliefs and feelings with these students is going to be different, but we do need to explore their beliefs and feelings because they may have some negative affect and not, like I said, not be able to language it. Their frustration may come out and look like stubbornness or shutting down, um, but maybe it's because they're not feeling like they can communicate, okay? And so we wanna be able to give them that language and help them learn to communicate when they're frustrated about their speech and then help them learn to deal with that frustration in, in ways that help them. So those are just a few specifics. Um, I, Scott, if you wanna piggyback on to any of that. Oh, and you don't have to hear all of this from me. We have on our website an entire book on stuttering and Down syndrome. Because if you, have, if you don't know this exists, I hope that this becomes something that you share with everyone. Because this question comes up a lot and people go online and they can only find small bits here and there. And there's a whole book a wonderfully well-written book that we happen to be the, the USA distributors of that can help you in your in your work with these kiddos. Indeed, that was the, the thing I was going to add is there are two resources specifically on this topic. One is the book Exploring Fluency and Down Syndrome by Monica Bray. The Stuttering Foundation also has a brochure where they've uh, taken some of Monica's work. I mean, Monica has contributed the work to it to create a brochure. So here is this, and you can find it on the Stuttering Foundations page. This is just a quick overview of Monica's work, but if you are interested in more, um, this book is terrific. The reason we carry it at Stuttering Therapy Resources is because it's published in the UK by JNR Press, and the overseas shipping, as our international customers know, is just very expensive. So we publish some of JNR's books here and they publish one of our books there just to reduce the shipping and to make it easier for people to access it. If you're in the UK, you'll want to order the book from them. If you're in another country, we can, we can just check the prices and see which is better for you for the shipping. We carry it here. We can ship anywhere. They carry it there. They can ship anywhere. Just, just a matter of trying to save a bit on, on the shipping, which is expensive. Um, may I just add one more thing to the Down syndrome and then... Um, then we're going to run out. One of the things that I noticed, that my, my experience with this population is not as extensive as Nina's, but one of the things that I've noticed is that sometimes when these kids stutter, they stutter hard, big, hard blocks. Certainly not always, but, but there's that almost like a tactile aspect of, the sense, uh, of that sensation of physical tension. And so one way to help them is to not take a fluency orientation here, because as Nina pointed out, fluency is going to be really hard for them. Take a communication orientation to ensure that they are able to express themselves, even if it contains stuttering. It's okay to stutter. But 
specifically for this physical yeah. tension, one of the most concrete aspects of therapy that we do is tension reduction work. When you're doing tense stutters and easy stutters, and tense stutters and easy stutters, that learning about the sensation of physical tension may be, of course, it depends upon the student, but may be accessible to them in a way that easy start may not be. If you can help them learn to stutter with less physical tension, that improves their communication ability. Sure, they still stutter, but it improves their communication. So that's one thing that, that I have found that also helps me, in addition to everything else that Nina's talking about here, about understanding um, how, how brain functioning works, how we think, how we plan, and where those limitations might be. Great. That's the end of our planned program. <laughs> yeah, and um, wow, we're coming right to the end the of the hour. hour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's uh, 59 minutes after the hour, whichever hour for whichever time zone you're in. Um, I just want to say thank you for everybody. Don't leave yet, okay? But I want to say thank you to everybody who's been on the call. This is where I'm going to end the recording then for Stuttering Therapy Resource Office Hours. This will be posted on our website by Monday under the resources tab. It I'm going to ask you to say that again because I had paused the recording. I'm sorry. Look for us on YouTube. Subscribe, Stuttering Therapy Rest, so you get the notifications when they go on YouTube. Also, join us on all the social media accounts. Uh, in particular, Instagram, we're trying to increase our presence there. So please share the information.